And today it's the last day of our MACAS conference, and I uh, think we had until now, and we have a very great conference. So I would like to thank very much Uffe for this great organization. It's a great conference. Thank you for that. And I would like to uh, thank Klaus also, because he's uh, the one who uh, supported all the Marcus conferences so much uh, with all his energy. And so thank you to Klaus as well. So now I'm, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Ani Savard. Ani Savard is Associated Professor in Mathematics Education in the Department of Integrated Studies in the Faculty of Education at McGill University that is in Montreal in Canada. So we have uh, now um, presenters from all over the world. We had some from Europe, from Asia, from uh, Middle America, now from the north, the cold north. And, Canada, I think, in <laughs> Montreal. So uh, welcome, and um, I uh, tell you something about uh, Anis Sabat. She taught at the elementary level um, for a very long time, many <coughs> years. She was author, consultant, and trainer for the Ministry of Education uh, in Quebec. And um, she has uh, uh, experience in at the Laval University in Quebec uh, in the bachelor she, she did there, the master in didactic of sciences and the PhD in didactic of mathematics at the Faculty of Education or University Laval in Quebec um, City in Canada. Her research interest, um, yeah, I watched, at, looked at your uh, website and you <laughs> <laughs> said uh, the mainly centers uh, on the development of mathematical skills and some examples is, for example, the development of student reasoning, uh, teacher preparation of pre-service teachers and professional development for teachers for, to say, some of the interests. Today, we are uh, looking for a very uh, nice uh, and important uh, topic because I heard uh, every normal person has uh, to do uh, 110 decisions in average a day. So uh, perhaps you had to yeah. do some decisions in the morning <laughs> and um, it goes on all the day. A normal person, I think we all have to do much more decisions <laughs> that you will uh, tell us about this. So thank you and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Astrid for this nice uh, introduction. And I want to say thank you for, I'm, I'm very honored uh, to be here and to do this keynote. Thank you very much for your lovely invitation. So uh, like Astrid said, I'm going to talk about making decision in a complex world and how to use um, mathematics as a guide in our world. Okay. This, po this topic is important for me because too often I have heard elementary school students saying, why should I learn that? And I used to say, oh, you will need that in secondary school. And then I was like, that's wrong. You need that now. And that's, that, wa that was important for me to make them aware of that. And then I developed this uh, theory, and I tried things. And uh, I think this is it. We need mathematics in our life and to use it purposely. So let me talk about a little bit about the complexity on our world. So we're living in a very complex world, and the complexity is increasing by the knowledge needed to make relevant decisions for ourselves and for our community. Community, crisis, economy, identity, health, sustainability, and technology are some of the prominent facets of this complexity that make the worlds we use to know a different place to be in today. This is a robot developed by MIT. So there's a huge, a huge research on robotics, how to use robots in our life to make it more easy or to even replace what we're doing we human. So the world is changing so fast without strong knowledge and skill, it is hard to navigate into it. Okay, Tesla, Usian, so they only use robots. 
okay, uh, uh, in California. So I was thinking, I'm training students, but which job are they going to do? So what do we know about jobs of the future? I'm going to show you a little clip, and it's not in the future, it's now. Amazon, California. Working in a factory is not a new job, but see now how it's look like. Okay, all the robots make the whole things, and they have um, chips in the floor so that the robot can move. Okay, as soon as you order something, a robot move. Okay, so uh, all all this system, you know, it's all the person behind who create that. This is the important thing, the ideator behind that. So this is now, okay? And it was a, a video recorded in 2016, okay? If we look about the job of the future, what do we know about them? Excuse me, I want to, ah, please. Here are two jobs that will not exist in 10 years. Number 10, post office worker. As the world continues to embrace digital technology, the need for post office workers is decreasing by the day. Number nine, loan officers. To minimize risk, more and more of the loan process at banks and other lending institutions is automated. Loan officers are slowly becoming a thing of the past. Number eight, college professors. So the college will be taught by a robot or a college student at home to learn the way that one learns while taking online courses. The job of being a college professor as we know it today may soon become a profession of the past. Number seven, cashier. With the success of self-checkout in many grocery chains, the job of a cashier is being replaced by robots. Soon the entire process of paying for groceries and other items will be automated. Number six, travel agents. Believe it or not, there are still travel agents that you can call to help book a trip. As technology advances and competition between resorts and airlines increases, the need for a travel agent will soon be completely obsolete. Number five, bank tellers. Every time I go to a bank, I'm surprised that there's still a need for bank tellers. Now trust me, I'd rather interact with a human than a machine, but there's no way this job will exist in 10 years. Number four, insurance salesperson. Much like the process of getting a loan, the insurance process is highly automated and is only becoming more automated every day. In 10 years, the job of an insurance salesperson will not look anything like it does today. Number three, telemarketing. There was a day when telemarketing was a great way of marketing your product. Today, telemarketing is highly outdated. Marketers will continue to adapt and find new ways of selling their products. Number two, librarians. As the world becomes more and more digital, we will need fewer and fewer librarians. While libraries will probably always exist in some form, the number of libraries and the number of librarians will decrease drastically over the course of the next decade. Number one, fast food workers. The problem with having humans work at fast food restaurants is the potential for food contamination and inconsistencies in how food is prepared. And the fact that humans 
have your lawn and are expensive to hire. In the near future, most fast food restaurants will be automated. Everything from the kitchen to the delivery of your food will be done by machines. Hey guys, thanks for watching this Epic 10 list. Are there other jobs, professions that you know of that might not be around in the next 10 years? Let us know about them in the comments below. Give this video a big thumbs up and we So we're still training them for those jobs. So I'm thinking about our education system. What is made for? What's the, what's the future is going to look like? So in the, um, they have some people who try to predict the future. And those wizards are very popular among uh, tech developers because they want to know the new trends and uh, influence the society. So here is the, my last clip about a uh, job of the future, but this time it presents new jobs. We didn't think about it. <laughs> Welcome to another video from explainingthefuture.com. Today, some people have jobs such as web designer that would have been difficult to even explain to people 20 years ago. In this video, I therefore thought I'd present my top 10 of potential new future jobs. At 10, we have in store 3D fabricator, or somebody who uses 3D printers to copy and manufacture things in retail locations on demand. At 9, we next have domestic robotician, or somebody who supplies and maintains robots that can help out in the home. Talking of which, at eight, we have AI trainer, or somebody who helps young artificial intelligences to understand the world and to become sentient. Turning to things medical, at seven, we have transhumanist surgeon, or a doctor who upgrades people's bodies to give them beyond human capabilities. Closely related at six, we then have nanobot immune system or mentor or somebody who cures disease or otherwise improves people's health by introducing nanobots into their bloodstream. In a similar vein, at five comes human DNA program, or somebody who cures disease or otherwise alters the human body by reprogramming a patient's DNA. At a final medical entry, at four, we then have cosmetic bioprinter, or somebody who makes people look younger or otherwise change their appearance by removing existing flesh and by putting on new skin. Turning to future food production, at three, we have vertical farmer, or somebody who raises crops and rears animals in skyscrapers in the middle of cities. Rising to two, our penultimate entry is space elevator attendant, or somebody who ferries people and cargo into space in a lift carriage that climbs a very long cable to an orbital platform. And finally, at one, we have climate engineer, or somebody who uses geoengineering to control global warming by constructing solar sails to shade the earth, building greenhouse gas filtration plants, or introducing algae into the oceans. So there you have it my top 10 of potential new future jobs. But if you can think of any others, please let us all know down in the comment section and we'll have a chat about it. But now that's it for another video and I hope to talk to you again very soon. <laughs> so if you think those looks crazy, just to tell you about the research in the medical field, they use engineer to make a bioengineer part of the body. And you know about the bionic people, but it, it's the reality now. So they have, in, in, um, in some engineering school in uh, my country, they have specialization between uh, biology, uh, medical engineering to help. And right now, I know that it's a project in Silicon Valley they want to create chips so we can, they can put it in our brain so that it helps us to memorize and get things done. So this is trends, but there are people working in this direction, okay? even though it looks like very strange for, for us now. But doesn't mean it's going to happen, everything is going to happen, 
but this is what is, is, is the prediction for now. So, I, I said earlier, our world is changing very fast. What do we use to do to navigate in our world? In navigation system, we used to, to have some tools to get some directions, right? So what do you do when we're using these tools? We use information to make a decision. So I want to go at that place. I use a compass, oh, now, or a map, and now I know how to get there, okay? But are we still using this tool? Is it enough? So if I use a map and then I decided to go at this point, what's happened in real life? I plan and then I face off that or that or that. Then I have to rethink, make another decision, another decision on the spot. So while you drive, you make so many decisions without even thinking, right? Of course, those maps are updated. Now we have GPS, we have important tool, but are they enough? Can I just use the information without have a, a, a deeper thinking about it? So what about augmented reality? Which one is real? It's, it's there, you know, with the Pokemon games, it was augmented reality. Now it's kind of for fun, but it won't be for fun. In Silicon Valley, developers think about this and they want to have like glasses like this so that you have a GPS in your glasses like this and then you see the path, a green arrow on the floor to tell you where to go, okay? And while you drive, you say, I want to, I want to go in a restaurant, tick, tick, tick. And then you will have balloon from the sky showing different restaurants. So you're going to be in the map. So this is the augmented reality. But then you have the total immersive real virtual reality with the Oculus headset. Of course, the school guys is playing, right? A game. But I decided, me too, I want to do that. So I did. So that's me using the headset. You can see here, this is what I see in my headset. And I use a program which is named Tilbrush. It's like paint, but I was inside the painting. And I decided to do creative thing, things, okay? But when I wear this device, I was immersed in another reality, but I was still in this reality. So how to navigate between those two reality? As you, you know, as you see, it doesn't have long cable, but I had long cables around me. And in the headset, when you walk close to a wall, you see a Cartesian plan telling you there's a wall. But if something like a chair, you know, while I was walking, I heard a chair and there's cable. So just to show you what it's look like, uh, I have two remote control because with the remote control, if I look at them, they're boring, two remote control. But when I put the headset, I see different things with the remote control. I see, I can make Selection, I can select button, I can select brush, I can select color, I can select effect. So I can do an art um, product, okay? So, and you see in the real reality me doing that, but in fact, I was selecting that. So just a little clip and you see how we look stupid with that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm selecting, and you see the button here, right? And then I move my head, and you can see as I move. And then I create. Select something else, because I just want to try the effect, you know?
And then you see my movement. Then I select, then I, I paint. Then I paint. OK, select. Oh, no, I say, ah, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I like, and then I have to walk, but I didn't know I, I was looking. You know, I use my own knowledge, but I cannot see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then uh, I look very strange, but yeah, you see the effect. So. And, and when you take off the headset, there's nothing left. This is really strange. So it changed our whole perception of the space. Okay? And just to show you my final product, and I walk, it was, I walk around it, and I can make effect around it. But then I decided, OK, I did some art, but what about math? So I decided I'm going to do a triangle. OK, just try it out. So I said, with my remote control, I'm going to do a triangle like this. What I've done is this. I said, oh, no, 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 no. That's not a triangle. So I decided with my remote control, oh, yeah, like the. So I said, chick, chick. Then I say, ah, made it. I made it. See. But you can see that I use three straight lines. You can see that. And then I decided, oh, I did a triangle, but I'm in the space, so why not walking around the triangle, right? To see from different point of view. So this is in the the, the, the front I I look, oh, this is like this, OK? I, I, I step back to look. But then I decided to come closer and to really look around. And as I look around, uh-oh, I realize it's not a triangle anymore. You can see the plan. And then I say, oh, but I thought it was a triangle. And then I was behind my triangle. So, no, my construction didn't work. And then the other side, see? You see my construction. And then I decided to look back like this. And I took picture, of course. <laughs> so, but for me, it was a triangle. But I had a di different experience because I can use the space around my triangle. It was not only a 2D object. It was a 3D object I created. Okay? So it was just a, an experimentation I've done. But I truly believe that teacher at college, you know, university professor won't be gone. We will teach in this environment. <laughs> this is my prediction. So it's not going to be robot. It's us in this virtual environment. So that students we can meet, they can be home and we can meet in the room, in a virtual room, and we can have interaction and manipulation. You know, um, there's a, right now with the virtual reality, you can play ping pong with someone. Okay, you, so I think it's, it's, it's the new trend. So this is a an, an, uh, shortcut um, about what's the near future we're in can look like. But how can we make decision? It's, it's hard without this technology, but it's even harder with this technology. So I study the decision making process. Okay. So for me, it's really important to make it consciously so that it became a natural uh, habits of mine. So for instance, I will give you uh, an example about how it might work. The other day, I was with my son, and I, I saw a tea shop. And I offered him, do you want to have an unmade, unmade iced tea? I said, yeah, we're dirty. Why not? 
So recognize a need. We're thirsty. Okay? As simple as that. Then we came. We identify the option. So they have different kind of iced tea, of course. Black tea, green tea. Okay? So black tea, and they have option, and green tea, and they have option. So we say, okay, for me, I say, I don't like black tea, so just forget about this one. So I'm going to focus on this one. Good. Then, oh my god, then I was not able to decide between green tea with mint and with, or green tea with ginger. And then I said, okay, if I take green tea with mint, I will like it and it's good for health. If I take ginger, I will like it, it's good for health. But what's happen if I don't like them? I will lose my money and I will still be dirty, thirsty. So I say, I should think about something, another one. So I was just going all around, around this idea. And then I decide, maybe I shouldn't drink tea. But then I say, I'm thirsty. I have to look again. Maybe I should go to another restaurant. Oh, no. It's so it, it was just playing around and around like this. After five minutes, my son said, Mom, take them in one. I said, are you sure? And then I explained my reasoning. What if I don't like it? Doesn't matter. But I'm. I'm thirsty, you can buy another one. But I'm going to lose my money, you can afford it. <laughs> so take that one. I say, OK. So I, I was not able to come over there. That was my problem. I was running around and around like this, and not this path. So I took one, and then I validate. Yeah, it tastes good. It was a good choice. But then it was not finished. He lectured me, Mom, you took too much time to make your decision. And I was so proud to be analytical and think about my option and so on. And he said, no. And say, huh, why not? He said, Mom, this decision is not important in your life. You don't need to spend much than 15 seconds. You're making so much decision in your life. Don't spend five minutes on these stupid things. Keep this time to bigger decision, long-term decision. So with uh, more personal implication and more important than this one. So I don't know if you heard about that, but this decision making is really important. All the leaders in the tech business world are so into it. For instance, Steve Jobs always wear jeans and uh, the same uh, green, gray um, shirt. And uh, Steve Zuck, Steve, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has 15 same pair of jeans and 15 t-shirts, all gray. Because they don't want to make decision in the morning. What should I wear? <laughs> it's not important. They just pick this. It's going to work. And then make important decision. Okay. So our world and our le leaders are driven by this process. So for me, making decision is really a competency. And what is a competency? Is a, 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 the use of knowledge and with different resources and different skills. And skills can include uh, physical skills, but mental skills. Okay? And it's not only about knowledge. It's about how the system works together. <laughs> So for me, you cannot transfer the knowledge. It's not possible to transfer knowledge. I can transfer a letter. I take the letter, and it's the same I bring here. But knowledge, you have to mobilize the knowledge. So why? Mobilize is not only use or apply. It is also adapt, differentiate, integrate, generalize or specify, combine, orchestrate, so conduct a set of mental complex operations that connected at the situation and in context, 
transform knowledge instead of moving them. So I have knowledge, but depending on the context, I have to use it in a different ways. And one of uh, a good example I have, so I can teach my student how to cook a crepe and practice how to cook a crepe. But then I cannot ask them the day after, please cook a lasagna with vegetables and different ingredients to manage, right? But it's a, it's a transition. They can cook, but they have different goals, they have different resources, and they have different skills. So it's important, it's always situated. The knowledge is situated. This is why it's really hard when students learn in the math class some uh, important uh, uh, formula or function they need to use in the science. They were developed in a one way, in one context in the math. And then we ask them to use them. We ask them to transfer. It's not possible. They have to reorganize, they adapt to make them happen. Okay. So it's the same for decision making process. Next time I'm going to buy tea. I will be that long for sure. <laughs> I, I had developed some knowledge and maybe uh, decision making skills, but I learned something out of uh, the, 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 the one I bought. So for me, it's really important that this process is done with a critical thinking eyes. So critical thinking is based on criteria. Okay? So it's not just I like, I don't like. It, there's a justification, there's something, there's explanation, reason behind. So it's self-corrected, okay? I recognize I have bias. Uh, I recognize uh, I can doubt about what's presented to me and about my own process. I have doubt and curiosity. And it's all based on the context. It's not making all over a generalization, okay? It's, it's really context-driven. And in fact, critical thinking is creating a judgment, but you can, you have to defend it. And it's the defending part which is important. Because you need to make arguments. And the arguments are, has to be strong and relevant. So it could be an authority argument, or it could be uh, based on scientific evidence based, but it has to be done. And this can be developed in elementary as well. Okay? I, sh I taught my son when he was five years old how to make an argument, how to create an argument. He asked me, somewhere, somebody asked me something, and I said, no, you cannot. And then he said, but I really want. And then I said, OK, convince me. You have to convince me. He said, I want. And I said, I don't want. What should we do? So we, I assess with him the reason, okay? the relevance and the, the, strong net, the strength. Critical thinking can be used in mathematic classes to examine, report, and evaluate all aspects of a situation or problem, including collecting, organizing, storing, and analyzing information. So student needs to be able to draw their own conclusion from the information and be able to identify inconsistency and contradiction in the data. So when the teacher asks, is that true? Is that true all the time? Can we generalize that? So this supports the, the uh, critical thinking development. And here, you can see some example of critical thinking in all steps. Do I really need that? Can I think to other options? Are they valid options in this case? Do the action to indicate are possible? You know, always doubt in. Always put that in consideration. Did I select the best option in this case? Validation is important. Did I select the best option? What I will do next time? My decision is supported by which argument if I have to define, define it? So critical thinking for me is the key to navigate in our complex world is needed to use information and to adapt to our world-changing world. 
help us to make informed decision, and should be an, an habit of mind. And it's not always when it's time to vote. It's in every moment in our life. I was really in, uh, inspired by this model, because this model tried to bridge the uh, real world, the sociocultural aspect, and the um, mathematical context. And I see critical thinking over there. That's bridge both on them and the implication of results, but when developing the mathematics. And this is uh, inspired uh, by uh, Miko Pare and Greer. And I developed this model. I, I add the ethnomathematics. Because ethnomathematics is a research program in, uh, of the way in which cultural groups understand, articulate, and use the concept and practices which we describe as mathematical, whether or not the cultural group has a concept of mathematics. And with children, it's all often mathematical, or even common, common sense. Moreover, ethnomathematics is found not only in exotic culture, but also in the day-to-day -day practice of groups within our own culture. Of course, when I did work with Inuit, uh, also known as Eskimo, uh, it was so evident for me those cultural differences. But uh, inside my own culture, we can see uh, those cultural differences. Um, I developed the model. I add the critical thinking. And for me, the critical thinking is all about the process. And it support decision making, but it also can be developed without making decision. And for me, this is citizenship competencies. You need that to navigate in our world. All citizens want to participate in, in, uh, in our society, but they need to be informed. I just want to present you an example what I've done in, uh, when I did my study, uh, my PhD study uh, many years ago, and uh, in my grade four classroom. So uh, at that time, uh, Pokemon cards were pretty popular uh, among my, my students. And the thing is, I observed them playing Pokemon card, but they were so clueless about it they lose their card. And then they, they were just thinking inside. They were sitting in the classroom, and they're just thinking, I lose my card. I want to play again. I want to have them back. And they develop uh, like a gambling addiction about it. Okay? And I was like, there's no rationality. I was talking to them, no rationality. It was all about emotion. No, they were not able to make a sense of the phenomenon. Oh, the Timuru cat, of course. <laughs> with meows. So I study gambling. And what is gambling? The outcome is impossible to predict with certitude, certainty. Money, object, action. You can bet them. It's gambling. Of course, you can bet and not being a, a, an addict, of course. But there's a risk. And research shown that kids play and more and more they play young, more and more they have at risk to develop a gam a pathological gambling behavior. So they bet money, uh, they bet object, uh, scratch tickets. Excuse me. The research shown that gambling addiction is the most difficult addiction to care. It's worse than drugs or cigarettes. It's always in mind. And it's really, really hard to cure. So they push a lot on uh, prevention in the school before having gambling. Because one of the thing is gamblers and even people, they have the illusion to control the luck. Oh, I have my lucky numbers. Oh, this time the machine's going to pay. You know, they have this magical thinking, hard to change. Okay. So I said, my kids are making decisions about playing with those cards outside the classroom. So what can I do inside the classroom to help them to make decisions about playing or not? Okay, Because it's their decision at the end. So I, d I create a lesson, Okay, name, create a scientific experiment with your lucky charms. Okay, And uh, it was part of uh, other lesson as well on probability. So the liquid charm was 
quite at the beginning, you know, uh, before the probability lesson. I had 27 students. Uh, I taught in French, and it was a suburban school in Quebec. So think about it. I was the regular teacher of those kids. I was the, the researcher, and I was the tech guy. And it has its implication how I made decision. Because as a researcher, I'm going to ask this question. But as a teacher, I'm going to look at the time, the clock, say, oh, I, I have to to be outside to outside for the recess time. And then with the, with the tech, oh, this microphone is close enough. Okay, So all playing in my mind in the same time. Okay, So uh, just a few words about the diction experiment. So I use uh, Atlas TI to analyze the data. What I've done on a Monday, on, on a Friday afternoon, I discussed about Lucky Charm. I asked him, do you have Lucky Charm? He said, yes, we have. I say, ah, bon? And do they work? He said, yes, yes, they work. They're good, they're good. Ah, they're good. OK, why don't you bring them in class? And we're going to do something with them. Perfect. They were very happy to bring it. But of course, it was a weekend. And then <laughs> Monday, not all of them had them. But anyway, so we said we're going to do a scientific experiment with them. Okay. They had to design their own scientific protocol with a, using a drawing. So they were. In, you know, in my classroom, I didn't have a desk. It was just long table to have collaborative work. So each table, they had, this is a lucky charm for him. So, uh, and then the design, you say, use a drawing. And they say, what should, no, no, you decide. Because the methodology part was important. Okay? And because I made it as an experiment, because research shown gambling is a student are at risk when gamble. So I cannot ask them to gamble, right? So we have to study the phenomenon. OK. Uh, so each time, the side and had different protocol, OK? Um, so I launched the task. They performed. And then we had a discussion about their result, OK? So. I, I came table by table, table by table, and I asked them about their result. Okay, so the first team, all members agreed that their lucky charm works pretty well and give them luck. Oh my God! I was like, what decision-making moment? What should I do now? I didn't expect those results. What should I do? Then I say, okay, I'm going to go to the next table. Okay, leave that as is. So. Yeah. Second team, all members agree that their lucky charm works in their head. If we say my lucky charm will be lucky, I will win. This is what makes luck. So I say, oh, ho, I have to try uh, to find a counter example to make them think to other contexts. Generalization, is that true all the time? What about the outcome of a drawing? OK. Then. My student respond. Some people believe into it a lot. If they don't have it, they will be desperate, and they, they, will, they will say, I lose. I do not have my lucky charms. Will they still win? No. They will lose because they will say that. We had to be positive. So that the fact they will lose, they lose. Even in a draw or in all situations, when you say they are going to lose, do you speak when they play soccer or football for you guys? But for us, it's soccer. Um, my student respond, it was he who said that in his head, I lose. I do, I do not have my lucky charms. And this has an effect on the outcome of a drying. Not really in a drying, but when you play soccer, if you say you will lose, you will lose. So he, th this little boy plays soccer a lot. And his coach, you know, try to make them positive about it. Believe in your, in your capacity. And the students say, with my luck and charm, I run faster. This is what he said uh, after that, OK? Make sense of what he was saying. With my lucky charm, I can win because I run faster. But then I say, but with a drawing, are you running? What are you doing in drawing? Oh, we're doing nothing. We just buy the ticket. 
Okay, so how it helps you then? Third team, their initial conclusion, they have the same power. So all, <laughs> they assess the power of the lucky charms, okay? So they said they all, all the same, all same power. But after he hearing the student, they said, yeah, but a lucky charm, it helps more to believe we can do it. It helps us overcome trials. So yeah, it makes them think about, yeah, he is right. So, 14, they test only one lucky charm. They guess the number to be drowned. Initial conclusion, it helps to have a lucky charm. It helps to focus what number it will choose. So they said, someone uh, pick a number and the other have to guess which. And the one with the lucky charm was more focused. So this is what they thought. Okay. So the 15, the 15 they put their name on a little piece of paper, but one little girl put a bigger piece of paper, so she won more often because of the, the size of the paper, okay? Uh, this is really chance. Sometimes the lucky charm, it cannot always bring you luck. So they say, it's it not always true, but you know, but we had this happen too, right? So they were critical about, about the, the whole process. But the conclusion, lucky charms encourage. In a drawing, it does not really encourage. But suppose it's a soccer game, it can encourage to have a lucky charm. A draw is like a little chance. So, so then they assess the validity the, the, of, of the, the, um, the domain of the validity of the lucky charm. It, it might help you when you do something. You do something, but when it's totally chance, we cannot say it works really well. So they test the lucky charm by passing it around. And no, it didn't work. And then they said maybe because it was not our lucky charm, but we're not sure, but it didn't work. Then I had this wonderful question. Can we trust our experiment? Are they valid? You know, I came back to the methodology because with the conclusion, sometimes it was hard to conclude. I said, yes, even if we, if we use different processes, we, had, we have similar result. It is an object that makes you believe in yourself. It was their final conclusion. And then I said, okay, I have to come back with my disaster team because I cannot leave that as is. So then I start to press on their process, process. and then they said, we were five people, and then four of us had a lucky charm. So we, we bring a tuk, which is a winter hat, and we put our name into the hat, but we didn't put the name of the one who didn't have his lucky charm. So he said, he never won. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, oh no. And then he said, he never won. And then we did like soccer tournament. We, we draw and then someone win. And then we did another one and then, and all of us, we had our lucky charm, we won one time, so it works. <laughs> so I rephrase that. So here in this team, they were five students. They experimented only with four names. Brendan has not experienced because he did not have his lucky charm. Does it change the experiment? So the boys they said, in, in the team, they said, no. But the girl said, yes. Say, OK. We, the girl said, we cannot know if it brings luck or not. Because if it's everyone who participated at the lucky charm, you cannot know if it's luck or not. So is what you should have been? Well, it would have been had Brendan participate because he would have known if Lucky Charm could. It was mandatory to be there. It, it would have left less chance to others. So here you can see an understanding of probability. So the, the student explained her reasoning. She justified her reasoning by using qualitative probability here. One, it's not possible to win if your name is not in the app. Two, it's possible to win if your name is in the app. And three, 
if your name is in the app, then the probability of the others decrease. So I really see then the bridge, okay? Because they were talking about their experiment and then we start to go in this context in order to assess. So the conclusion, Lucky Charm helps to, helps to increase our confidence, especially when we do something doesn't mean that we will uh, win a drawing for sure. And that was important because the research in gambling shows that gamblers co make confusion between ability and chance. So in a drawing, they try to bring their, uh, an elephant okay, to bingo because they said, okay, they, they can control the outcome using this. So they have like a, a power, an ability when in fact there's no ability at all. It's a random process. Uh, Sometimes control random, but the, the participant had no power on this. Okay, that all. So my student establish the probabilistic vocabulary, possible and possible certainty, which is funda foundation for learning probability in early years. And they talk about, they didn't name it, but in fact it was illusion of control. Okay, how to control the outcome using an object when it's, it in fact is not. And then they try to be critical because they said it works in one context and not in this context. And in the context when I can put an action, uh, it helped to build my confidence. So it's really driven by me and not in this context. So just an example how we can um, propose situation. Of course, after that, they have to mathematize and do uh, uh, use numbers and so on. But it was just the introduction because I found that when you talk about probability, those illusion of control, those conception are there. And then they live parallel in mind. So, um, research, just an interesting point. Research, uh, I've read research done. They had university students in statistics and they bring them in a casino and they make them play. And at first those guys and, and, and girls say, no, 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 statistics, you know, the, we know the odds and uh, it, it's not good playing. And you know, they were very rational, really mathematics and statistics about the games. But more the more they play, more and more they, they start to have different conception. More they think about, oh, next time is going to pay. Next time is going to win. It's my turn to win now. And they develop this um, magical thinking about the game. So it's one of the reasons why in a casino, you know, they block all the windows. They, uh, they don't have um, uh, clocks. So you keep loose of time. You are in another world so that you don't reason the same way you reason outside this world. To lose that kind of rationality. And then they put sounds, exciting sound, oh, it's going to be my turn, it's going to be my turn. Even, you know, some gamblers, they talk to the machine before playing, you know, petting the machine so that you're going to be uh, gentle with me, you're going to pay um, in some, uh, so this is uh, something uh, important to say because their decision-making process is not the same in this environment. It's really different. Uh, people uh, use diaper to stay in front of the machine. They don't want to, to, to get out, okay? So, yeah, th that's it. Uh, it's, it's, it's documented. There's a huge research in uh, psychology of gambling about uh, those uh, behavior and those mental cognition, okay? Uh, and now it's even worse difficult because with the online, the accessibility is even, uh, it's even more accessible with the online. And um, uh, in a research center, they study the online. So when it's free, you win more often than when you pay. So then you play, say, oh, that's free and it's, I don't put money. Oh, if I put money, I should have one. Uh, three, four hundred dollars or euros, oh, that's fine. So I'm going to put my credit card and then it's easy to win. But then they change the probability. Okay? It's all about 
making decisions, being critical about all those things. Simple thing, opening an email. Is it's true or false? It's a real email or not? So about your bank account, and now the, the hackers are so creative with the university world, we receive, get in this conference, and it was a wrong conference. So it's, it doesn't exist. So you, you have to really, really uh, look and, uh, twice and think about it and raise questions, always doubt in. What do they want me to do? What do they, know, what do they want from me? So this is our world now. So we really need critical thinking to guide us like a GPS. So it's, I see that as a flexible thinking. So I want to make a decision. I want, I want to be critical. So it's really embedded and have doubt. Of course, they have external factors such as jet lags who make you make bad decision. <laughs> but you know about it. Then you can prevent. Uh, mathematical knowledge is not enough. We need critical thinking to develop mathematical knowledge, and we need mathematics to develop critical thinking. I think the point is important. I can know function and so on, and I can have a big, big uh, repertoire of mathematical knowledge. But if I'm not able to use it, to adapt it when I really need it, uh, what this knowledge should, sh sh what should I do with this knowledge? And critical thinking is, the, for me, the bridge. Because in order to make a decision, I can estimate a cost. I can, I can develop a mathematical model about it. <coughs> oh, all citizens should be able to participate in their society in an informed manner. More and more and more, the, uh, the strong trend is statistics in math education. Calculus has to be. Um, is needed for certain profession, but not for all citizens. Why st statistic is needed for all citizens? We receive so many uh, information. We need to. We are in a data world. We really need to have statistical and critical thinking using statistics to interpret our world. So I'm not saying uh, calculus shouldn't be taught at all, but I think statistics should have um, a pro. Um, a stronger place uh, in, uh, in uh, our curriculum. In my country, uh, we develop a probability st statistic uh, in grade one in order to develop this uh, stochastic reasoning, reasoning under uncertainty. And I think it's a good thing. But more things need to be done, because too often teachers say, oh, at the end of the, the year. I don't have time before, because the more, the more important stuff. But I think we have a key role to play uh, in, in this society. And one of them is uh, about the curriculum and how to teach students to make sense and to, to adapt. So thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Annie, for this inspiring presentation. Uh, we have two minutes for some questions. Are there some questions? Then I, yeah, then yeah. yeah. Uh, it was very interesting, thank you. Um, I wonder if you know the theory about predictive coding. It comes from the carpentry and neuroscience area, which is about that our brain is coded to make decisions, and that is what it is for. So it's very interesting. I don't know if you know. No, but okay. I would be and happy we'll to. Talk about it later. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because it, it's all the time making decision. What do, which word I'm gonna say? Which you know, it's all the time making small small yeah. decision all the time, and people are more and more aware about about this. So and uh, you know, there's a lot of um, in North America a lot on uh, computational thinking. So a lot of energy on that. And computational thinking, you're coding. But when you code, you, you, you can have different way to code to, to have the same product. And it's all about making decision because which link, because everything is follow the code. So uh, it's, it's everywhere for me. 
more questions. So I uh, would say it, your uh, presentation showed very good how important the job of a teacher is, and I hope the job of a teacher will be a, a profession in the future as well. So thank you very much, and we have a oh. big book for you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.